we may also have some other folks on um, from other states today. Um, so we welcome you all. We're inclusive in terms of region and all that. Um, my name is Russell. I'm a psychologist. Um, I've been facilitating these um, uh, echoes um, for um, clinicians who are engaged in medication for opioid use disorder. I think we're on about three years now, something like that. Um, pretty close to that, if, if, if a little shy. Um, and uh, we, you know, our, our focus tends to be sort of issues specific to um, opioid use disorder, um, but of course, something that is specific to treatment of people with opioid use disorder is how well are we doing and how well are the systems taking care of us and, and you know, how well are we taking care of one another. Um, so obviously this is a really important topic for all of us. Um, so we, we really appreciate everyone being on. Also just a little orientation. Um, if you have typically been on our echoes, um, you'll know that typically we do introductions and, and all that. And that's a really important part of echo. Um, because it's really meant to promote community. Um, it's meant to, to kind of reduce um, professional isolation. Um, and we worked really hard, all of us who come to this regularly, um, to, to try and promote that. Um, uh, that being said, we're not gonna do that today um, because we have a larger audience, I think, than what we typically do. Um, and um, so therefore, we'll just kind of kind of get to the chase. But we do, unlike typical, um, uh, uh, virtual learning um, sessions, webinars, things like that. The ECHO model is very much a, it's meant to be interactive um, and relational. Um, so please feel free to chat in questions um, in the chat box and I'll kind of monitor those as we go. And then also depending on time at the end, we can flesh out those questions and then also people can, can speak on whatever questions or, or issues they have. And also the important, well, it's all important, but one other important thing is that um, our CME CE code for today is 38 Axel. So that's 38 A like Apple, X like Xavier, E like everyone, L like love. So 38 Axel. Um, and with, well, yeah, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. Weibel, who we are so happy to have. I have to acknowledge, Dr. Ballister, who is one of our regular attendees, actually helped us make the connection to Dr. Weibel. So Dr. Ballister, uh, thank you for that. I um, appreciate it. Um, and I will uh, uh, move it over to Dr. Weibel at this point. All right, well, I will share my screen here if we can do that easily. And I think I just need to have you all tell me or somebody give me an indication that you can see this creating a culture of wellness. Yep, we're good. All right. Um, just a little bit of background on me. So I, I, uh, both my parents are physicians and I just felt like I was born to do this. I'm definitely in the right profession. There was no parental pressure to go into medicine. In fact, they tried to encourage me not to go into medicine, probably for my own mental health. Um, purposes and um, but never really gave the details about why you know there's so many uh, kids by the way I call them kids now because I'm 52 but there's so many people pre-meds and med students who have been told not to go into medicine by their family members who are physicians but they've never given them real can you, audio? can you hear me okay okay They've never given them real specifics about what the warning is really about. And I think when I go through these slides, it will become apparent that uh, I think many of us have mental health wounds from our education. We've been traumatized by just like seeing patients that are traumatized or amputations or gunshot wounds to toddlers. You know, I mean, during our medical training, we see stuff that nobody wants to see. And then we don't get help. We often don't get debriefing and we are in fact, punished if we seek mental health care often, uh, having to fill out those have you ever questions on the medical licensing forms. So I think there is this, um, this, this feeling of having to hide our humanity and not ask for help. And so part of creating a culture of wellness is being able to ask for help and being able to actually realize that yes, medical training was traumatic and yes, these were hazardous working conditions and some of us are still in hazardous working conditions and some of us have had our human rights violated um, through sleep deprivation, bullying, um, you know, racism, you know, different things that we've experienced um, in systems that are um, 
systems are just made up of people and as people change systems change but some of our systems in medicine are still quite antiquated and so I think this will be an eye-opening, provocative conversation. Feel free to add in the chat whatever your thoughts are as we go through this. I just wanna, you know, full disclosure say that once I was in medicine, I actually did become suicidal for the first time in my life. And um, that was due to being in working conditions that were not ideal for me. Uh, as a result, I opened my own clinic. I have been very happy in the past 15 years having a community uh, family medicine clinic, and uh, I help doctors all around the country running a suicide helpline. And one of the things that I feel like doctors are disillusioned about is the loss of autonomy and the inability to practice, you know, at their highest level independently. So that is one of the solutions that I see to um, to some of the mental health wounds is just kind of healing ourselves, assessing what we've survived, and considering whether you're in the right business model, and you know maybe you would be happier as an entrepreneur or a business owner. So um, without further ado, creating a culture of wellness um, has to do a lot with physician mental health. Um, if you're in a coal mine and your canary dies, you don't take deep breaths and do resiliency modules online, you get out of the coal mine. There's been a lot of emphasis on physician burnout, such words, you know, like uh, as in we're defective individually when really we are just having, in my opinion, the normal reaction anyone would have to being in a hazardous working condition or at least a non-ideal working environment. <laughs> so uh, the learning objectives today are three, uh, learning high yield targeted actions you can implement to promote wellness among physicians, understand how to create a culture of wellness, utilizing a concept I created called institutional triage, which I think is sort of easy to understand. Uh, discover also the highest risk specialties for suicide and what you can do to stop this crisis. And this is actually um, an email I got when I was putting the slideshow together from a general surgery resident. And by the way, there's a PDF of the slideshow that I gave to your uh, people who organized this conference. And so if anyone feels like they need to kind of look through this later, I'm sure either I or your organization can get you the PDF. Uh, also, if you were to Google creating a culture of wellness and my name, I have a more expansive version of this talk that's just online fully transcribed with uh, audio as well. So uh, this, this quote here is obviously from a surgery resident um, reaching out sort of just to state the obvious that it's been tough in her program and uh, she's experienced harassment and suicidal thoughts. Um, so the question that I have for you, and I'll just ask intermittently some questions just for engagement purposes, but what unique occupational hazards would lead residents, you know, that particular subcategory of physicians to experience suicidal thoughts? And um, I'm assuming most people here have been through medical school and residency and maybe reflecting back on your training to a time when you were struggling or maybe a colleague was struggling. Um, just it, feel free to post in the chat any unique occupational hazards that would really be uh, affecting residents or maybe affected you as a resident. And have you ever known of a medical student or a physician who has died by suicide? I think this is a really important one to add in the chat. So if you have, please at least put yes in the chat. Um, if you wanna list the first name or anything else, feel free to put that as well. But I, I believe that most of us have known or heard of a medical student or doctor who's died by suicide in our careers, which just goes to show you how significant this issue really is. And I want to offer everyone a free audio book here on uh, idealmedicalcare.org is my website. And um, if you click on books, you can download a free audio book version of the Physician Suicide Letters book, which I know it sounds like it's a depressing title, but um, there's about 52 or so chapters in there. Um, this is all different doctors, each chapter who are struggling with suicidal ideation. And this is really them processing with me in a print version of sort of their pros and cons list of why they would stay, why they would go. And uh, 46 of these people are still alive. Uh, the ones who have died, died before I ever interacted with them. And I'm, I'm actually interacting with their family members in the aftermath of their deaths. But I think this will give you 
a quite a unique view into physician psychology and what we can do to help one another and ourselves. And my concept of institutional triage is if we prioritize addressing the institutional issues causing physician suicide, we will create a culture of wellness for us all. So rather than sort of focusing on sort of burnout and things that happen for the individual at the end, kind of getting ahead of it by looking at how we can address systemic factors in medical education training and practice that will lead to wellness in everyone. <laughs> so we don't have to kind of put so many band-aids on people and catch people at the very end when they're truly suicidal. So this is a quote from a surgery resident who obviously faced some harassment, felt paralyzed by the bullying. I think this is much more common in certain specialties like surgery. She wrote me wanting to know if I could help her stop the flashbacks that she's still having in the aftermath of her training. And so here's the most disturbing sentence that anyone has ever written to me that I was less stressed in Afghanistan under active sniper fire than in med school. I really had to understand this further because that doesn't make sense to me as somebody who's never been in a war. I would just assume if bullets are flying towards you, that would be more stressful than med school. But actually, um, the reason that this medical student explained is that she essentially, and you could read this quote here, she felt like there was a true sense of 100% camaraderie and trust with her team in the military. Um, you know, they were all in the same uniform. They knew who the enemy was because they're dressed differently, right? They, and, and there was just this sense of uh, belonging, being brothers and sisters, knowing that worst case scenario, you got blown up, you, your body parts would be brought back, covered in American flag, and you would be buried in an honorable way and the purple heart and all of that. But there's not that sense in medicine. We're really groomed in an environment of competition in which we feel that our success is based on the person next to us failing. So, and they even say that in med school orientations, they'll say, look around the room, a third of you won't be here next year. You know, so there's this sense, you know, that you need to get ahead of everyone to survive. And that is really damaging to the mental health of people who are humanitarian idealists who go into this for noble reasons. Uh, and I think most of us do that. So uh, the difference between military and medicine is worth talking about because in the military, there is a common enemy. In medicine, uh, the enemy is disease, but sometimes it's your own colleagues if you're in competition you know, for market share or whatever it is. Um, uh, between hospitals, you know how hospitals can compete with each other and kind of cutthroat ways. Um, the language of war is used in military, but there's also war, metaf met war metaphors that are used in medicine. And so um, that kind of can create some fear, I think, in people because war is scary, right? Uh, there's teamwork in military, uh, turf wars in medicine. Um, I, I think when we talk about teamwork, often it's more lip service than in reality. In reality, I, I feel like people are really still competing with one another. Um, collaboration in the military, competition in medicine, there is a culture of trust in the military, and there is a culture of distrust in medicine. I mean, we are sometimes distrustful of the patient. Are they going to sue us? We're distrustful of our colleagues. Are they going to undermine us? We're distrustful of our program directors. We don't know if we can really be honest about our feelings. We have to hide our depression and anxiety. So there is a feeling of, of isolation in medicine that doesn't exist in the military. Um, and, the, and the suicide rate in the military is still really high just based on vicarious trauma and, and extreme trauma. But um, we have that and also a, a distrustful culture of competition. So, so we really need to start collaborating truly and break out of this competition model. And um, one way of doing that is to change the way we're teaching medical students and just to realize that as medical trainees, we're already like the cream of the crop and we're already, um, we're already, we're not slackers. We wouldn't be where we are if we were slackers. We, we, we study, we want to learn. And so I feel like pimping threats and insults are very contra, uh, they, they create flashbacks. They create permanent lifelong harm to the students who just want to learn and help and heal others. We need to stop with this. Uh, we, I think learning nonviolent communication, which is something you can literally learn 
online or bring in somebody who knows nonviolent communication in your town to teach for an hour in your department because there's ways of communicating that are nonviolent that are much more effective, uh, I think, for patients. For, for us as colleagues and for medical trainees. And it's, it's I, I took a class, it was awesome. I highly recommend it. And this is the website if you're interested in actually learning how to communicate with each other nonviolently without war metaphors and um, fear and insults. And express appreciation through action. Um, so I'm gonna explain ways that we can do that at the end that are very simple, that are extremely cheap that you can do right away without even getting approval from your department. So, and, and this is um, not waiting for, again, a top-down mandate to express appreciation through action on, appreciate, on, a, on a specific day, like, you know, Valentine's Day or Doctor's Day or Nurse's Day, but really just personally taking the lead and doing this organically as you feel your colleagues deserve to know that what they did was truly something you appreciated. And so a question is right now, what specifically can you do to create a culture of collaboration in your medical institution? I'm just gonna pause for 30 seconds while, you know, just stream of consciousness, type on the chat, anything that you think that you can do that would really create collaboration in, um, in your office, in your, in your hospital, in your medical school. And uh, I just wanna share that physician, again, mental health wounds are often due to uh, competition. Uh, collaboration leads to unification, competition leads to isolation. Isolation and hopelessness lead people down suicidal ideation and other sorts of thoughts that are really, really dangerous. Um, this is a quote from a physician who graduated med school with PTSD talking about being beaten down in clinical rotations. Again, still surgery is pretty toxic. Um, but but other, other programs in internal medicine, and I, I get these sorts of emails from other people and other departments. Um, this is just people hiding their tears and pain from one another, just from what they're experiencing in training. So um, this is a picture of emotional isolation. This is an actual, this is the first blog I ever published that really went sort of wild with viral shares. Uh, I think it, I don't know, it's close to 50,000 Facebook shares. Although my social share uh, plugin failed on my WordPress, I think I lost all the shares. So nobody knows how many shares it's had. That's sad because it was, uh, it's nice to see evidence that <laughs> that the thing was uh, popular, but the reason why it was popular is you can see there is a man there. This is 2015. This is an emergency physician who's kneeling outside the emergency room crying um, against a uh, cement wall in Southern California. And this is because a 19 year old patient of his just died. And I don't think he felt comfortable to cry in the emergency department. So um, he went outside to cry by himself, which is what a sad scene is that. I think there's a lot of doctors that are doing similar things, uh, crying at home, sneaking away into hallways, bathroom stalls. Uh, we see really sad things. Uh, if you're human, you should be crying because what we see is sad. Um, not to have a place to cry or even worse, I had a resident call me one day wanting to know if I had any scientific literature to prove that it was okay to cry because she got written up for crying at work. So this is the situation we're in where we are really dehumanized and expected not to cry, hug, you know, laugh with our patients, hold hands with them, be human. And as a result, you have doctors crying in parking lots. Um, the, this is a comment on that picture. The part most people, uh, and by the way, that picture was published with the permission of the doctor who was crying. It was taken by an EMT that was sitting in a car outside the emergency department. The part most people fail to realize is that this man now has to compose himself, walk into another person's room and introduce himself and, with a smile and handshake and probably see some other traumatic thing. So this is like trauma after trauma. Uh, this is called vicarious trauma. Vicarious trauma is the emotional impact of physician exposure. I'm, I'm, I'm tweaking this definition to apply to physicians, um, but it applies to anyone who basically is around traumatized people and you hear traumatized stories. You probably even watch the news lately. You'll be traumatized by watching videos of people dying and uh, it is traumatic. 
to be a witness to the pain, fear, and terror that patients have endured. Um, so uh, hurt people hurt people. That's just um, kind of a, a good phrase to remember. When you're hurt, you might inadvertently hurt others. It's really, really important that we process our pain. And we should have safe spaces to do that within medical facilities so that we're not having to cry in parking lots by ourselves. Um, here's some of the ways, obviously, that, that you can be traumatized by this work. Um, being around traumatized cynical colleagues, be, is having a medical error, feeling like it's your fault even when it's not, uh, not having anyone to debrief with so that you think it's your fault for the rest of your life, even though it isn't, but you never got to process it. Process it. Um, you know, obviously hearing patient stories of trauma and witnessing, you know, doing surgeries where the blood of the patient is on you, you witness the patient's last breath, you now have to tell the family the patient died, they were a teenager. Uh, trauma surgeons really have it rough. Uh, they're, they're watching a lot of teenagers die because if you look at accidents, um, teenagers are dying by accidents probably in a higher a higher rate than any other group. So there's a lot of having to tell families of teenagers that they're young children are dead and trauma surgeons are doing this. And in fact, I learned, I didn't realize this, that trauma surgeons have to actually bring uh, security from the hospital with them because obviously when you hear that your child is dead, you might react in an irrational way and try to attack the doctor that's telling you that tried their best to save them. So now you have the trauma of being in the belly of the patient with the gunshot wound trying to save the patient the trauma of being there when the patient dies, the trauma of having to call security to protect you from the traumatized family that you're now having. I mean, this is just, where does this end? And that's just one case. And I talk to trauma surgeons all the time and they've never gone to therapy and they've been doing this work for 30 years. Like that is a lot of trauma uh, to, to deal with. Uh, this is an anonymous physician that wrote yesterday, one of, you know, I know what that doctor's feeling, that doctor, crouched down against the wall. Yesterday, one of my 17-month-old patients died. I was in the bathroom crying in between, you know, privately between several, you know, times yesterday. I've cried in stairwells and hallways. It eats at you. Life is very fragile. The pain of losing those we are trying to help becomes a scar that doesn't go away. It has shaped who I am as a person. So creating a culture of wellness, um, really the culture determines our trauma response. So these are some things that I think we can do that would be very simple is like, okay, look, we already have recovery rooms in hospitals after surgery for patients. Why not have a recovery room for doctors and staff, nurses? You know, we already have chaplains in hospitals. I can't tell you how many chaplains have contacted me wanting to know how they can help. Well, if you're if they're calling you to speak to a family due to a death, uh, after you speak to the family, try talking to the staff because they had to witness that and actually press the call button that said, help, call the chaplain. And more than the family needs help, the staff needs help. And so I feel like there should be, you know, there's extra rooms in every hospital, broom closet that isn't being used, clean it out, turn it into something akin to a dorm room for a college student with a little lava lamp and affirmation poster, a little dorm fridge, so you don't have to steal crackers and apple juice on your 100 hour work week from the patient's fridge. And you can actually go in somewhere, take a breath, Grab a, grab a Kleenex so you don't have to cry in a parking lot and press a button for the chaplain to come talk to you and not write it in the EMR. Like don't pathologize this. You're a human being who's seen something terrible. In fact, you were the last, per you were the person that called off the code because the patient wasn't coming back. There should be a place for you to sit down and catch your breath before you go to the next case. So this just makes common sense and it's infrastructure and words we're already familiar with. So it's not like creating something completely new that nobody understands. Peer-to-peer um, -peer support is really important. Uh, these are already in existence. Uh, Balance groups, which I had during medical training and in my first job were awesome. Um, so a balance group is something where you process the emotions around a, a patient case. So it's not like you waiting until you're suicidal and having to be thrown on the lap of a psychiatrist. <laughs> this is like getting way ahead of it, you know, when you are actually in the aftermath of delivering that stillborn <laughs> within uh, that day or two, a balance group so that people can process their emotions rather than waiting till you need a psychiatrist years down the road, you know? And vet confessionals, I'll talk a little bit more about. It's a super cool program that anyone can do in any department. And uh, I really love, I love it. 
confidential mental health care, like trauma informed care. I feel like every single person in medical uh, training um, and in medicine or nursing or healthcare should be getting weekly uh, mental health checks, like non punitive, confidential, off your medical record, somehow out of the medical board's arena to subpoena, like confidential care uh, that's non punitive. Um, this is an uh, actual wall in my home business office of pictures of doctors and medical students who've died by suicide. I mean, this is like 1% of the like 1,500 I have on my registry now, uh, which again is still even the 1,500 plus is the tip of the iceberg. Like nobody has been super excited to collect these names and stories because let's just face it, it's depressing. <laughs> and people don't wanna keep thinking about all their colleagues who have died. And an interesting thing that happens I wanna share is there's this, this situation where I'll talk to somebody who will send to me a name of a colleague who died by suicide, I'll call them back up, and then they'll end up sharing, oh, and by the way, did I mention there was this other one 10 years ago, and oh, wait, my college uh, pre-med roommate also stepped out of the window. I mean, like you, hear about one and then attach to that one if you really have a longer conversation and build trust with the person that's submitting the name to me you find out several more and in fact I've had an old doctor who was retired an orthopedist call me back the next morning after a conversation related to the suicide of a colleague that I sought out more information on because it was a doctor in my town who died in 1996. I moved here in 97 and uh, he was an orthopedist and I wanted to try to figure out the circumstances around that suicide and so I was calling up a lot of retired orthopedic surgeons in my town and the next morning one guy he called me back he goes hey Pam I, I just want to let you know after I got off the phone with you I thought of um, five more doctors in town who died by suicide. So what I call this is suicide amnesia. You don't really want to remember these because they're so traumatic, but when somebody makes it okay to talk about it and it's um, you feel safe, suddenly come bubbling up uh, more than one person. And I think that's just the sad state of affairs we're in in medicine. Um, but this is um, these are not isolated cases. That's why I'm showing you the picture. This is actually... Uh, we have been reported to have the highest suicide rate of any profession, uh, higher than the military. Not by uh, like raw total numbers, because there's less doctors than people in the military, but by actual rate, uh, we lose more doctors, um, you know, per 100,000 than we lose military. Okay. Uh, these are the first 1,363 physician suicides that were organically submitted to me. So these are just people who know like, oh, Dr. Weibel runs a suicide hotline and she's interested in this topic and she has a confidential list of, of names and circumstances and gender and everything. So I've got a list divided by name, gender, you know, uh, age, specialty, date of death, method of suicide, and sort of a little backstory. Then I have another document that has much more detail than that. But in order to sort of look at them as data points, I sort of created this spreadsheet with now, now close to, you know, more than 1500 names on there. But at the time when I put this together, because it's not something I'm eager to do, go through there again and add more data. It's a little painful to read obituary, read hundreds of obituary, you know, it's, I, I have to kind of, uh, what would you say, get myself in the right mood <laughs> before I start going through the obituaries and talking to family members and really making sure they were suicides. But you can see that just raw numbers delivered to me, surgeons are number one, anesthesiologists number two. This is sort of just in raw numbers. However, similar to what I was saying with the military, uh, there's more family medicine doctors than surgeons, than anesthesiologists, you know, like there's, when you actually look at this according to active physicians per specialty, which is what this slide is, you see that anesthesiologists are just off the, off, out of the, out of the ballpark, you know, anesthesiologists are dying by suicide at two, at, um, they're the highest risk group. They're dying 5 time, 5.7 times the suicide rate of general internal medicine doctors. This is just according to my first 1,360. This is a snapshot, okay? This isn't written in stone, but this is a snapshot based on these, this data that I've collected. 2.2 um, times the suicide rate of surgeons, which are number two. But I think if you look at this, you start to see like the first, um, sometimes OBGYN and psychiatry switch. They're kind of close. Like when I 
depending on when I get more data, sometimes psych is number five and OBGYN is number four, but essentially, I would look at this, people want to know why. Well, anesthesiologists have quick access to lethal painless means, and if they're having a bad day, they can knock themselves out in a sec. So can veterinarians, veterinarians who have much, uh, the terrible student debt, um, paid much less than doctors, access to lethal painless means, and they're doing euthanasia you know, on pets all day long. It's, it's not much of a jump to think that maybe they should just knock themselves out if they're really suffering and again probably not getting the help they need in a non-punitive confidential way because they'd have to report to the veterinary board uh, that wants to know everything you're doing with anxiety depression and suicidality um, so so uh, i think the ones that are surgical specialties on the top you know in emergency medicine they're getting unexpected trauma like all day long and i think that is really scary that's hard right i mean the worst thing that happens to me what uh sebaceous cyst and grown toenail pap smear i'm not very traumatized by my work uh so family medicine isn't very close to the top psychiatry though they're not doing anything that's very traumatic as far as surgery they're listening to traumatic stories all day long incest and domestic violence and all sorts of things that you know gun that what they hear could take you on a nice little ride through vicarious trauma every day so i think that's why i mean pediatrics not too traumatizing unless you're maybe pediatric oncology and seeing small children die every day um you know so that's how i make sense of this um so the lessons that i've learned through all these years of doing this is that um of tracking this is that physician suicide is a public health crisis because one million american patients lose their doctors annually to suicide so um, that is a lot. You know, every doctor that dies has a patient panel of like two to 3,000 patients. So just do the math if they say 400 doctors are dying per year uh, of suicide, and that's not even counting the medical students, and it's still an underestimate because we're minimizing these. And, you know, unique to our profession, unlike uh, veterinarians or I don't know, construction workers or bankers, we're filling out the death certificates on our colleagues. And so we're, our denial is seeping into their death certificate. And plus the fact that if you're in a small town and you know the wife won't get an insurance payout, you're writing down it was an accidental, you know, car accident off the bridge at 3 a.m., even though you know the doctor was in the middle of a malpractice suit and that they were suicidal. And so we cover each other and lie on death certificates in a way that no other, you know, the military can't do that. Nobody else except doctors are really lying on death certificates. There you go. So I think we're covering up a lot of this. And like uh, the last talk I was at with you all uh, last week at this time, um, I think Russell pointed out that, you know, there's this whole subset of people who die by quote unquote accidental overdose that are really intentional and the uh, and only the person who's deceased knows the level of intentionality but in my mind at least with doctors of medicine we were trained to dose medicine it's probably highly unlikely that we're dying of an accidental overdose using a drug that we prescribe every day and never have had a malpractice suit uh, because we know the narrow therapeutic index we know how to dose it and we know how to off ourselves so that's i would put it you know a toddler on the bathroom floor with pink Tylenol pills, that's a 100% intentional, um, you know, accidental overdose. I don't think there's any 100% accidental overdose of a doctor of medicine. That is my informed opinion. Most doctors have lost a colleague to suicide, as we probably saw in the chat. I don't know, I'm not following the chat, but maybe some of you have stated that you've lost a colleague. Um, some have lost eight. I, I had anesthesiologists email me eight names, uh, several different ones, uh, uh, email me th that level of a number of colleagues that have died. And so late intervention is obviously less effective because uh, I interviewed a number of doctors who've died by suicide and they tell me that, because um, I asked them, once you decided that you were gonna slit your throat or shoot yourself in the head or overdose or whatever, like how long before you actually took action? three to five minutes, you know, so if we're going to wait till people are actually suicidal, you're going to have to be pretty heroic, like with a big cape and fly into their house, you know, from miles away and intervene. And you're probably not going to be as successful as doing this proactively with the culture change that is very simple that I'm going to share in this talk. 
So uh, by the way, what really startles people is that the doctor was doing great right before they hung themselves, you know, like they just had a successful, uh, performed a successful knee replacement. You know, they sort of can't believe that they're now hanging in the closet. Well, that's because the last thing that we lose as doctors is our work ethic. You know, like unlike other subsets of people in the population, like we really are able to uh, put on a smile and a starched white coat and uh, take everyone for a ride on denial with us. Um, uh, we suicide to end our pain, not because we want to die. We, we just want to end the pain, just generally. Anesthesiologists and veterinarians are highest risk. Surgeons are number two. Um, I think I explained this before, but the reason why these are highest risk groups is they're having a lot of trauma exposure. They're the most overworked, bullied, sleep deprived. They have easy access to lethal means. Um, so institutional triage, right? Before we can create a culture of wellness, we need to diagnose what is most unwell and treat it first. So um, when I analyze these first 1,300 cases of doctor suicide, I, I was thinking, you know, these people are not all dying by isolated different causes, right? There's got to be some common theme here. And the common theme that I discovered was that all of these people had sustained violations of their human rights in medical training and practice. And these are just a few things that are really common. You know, when you're on a 100 hour work week, you're, you're sort of under food and water deprivation. Surgeons are wearing, did you know, diapers during surgeries that are long and, um, you know, restricting their water intake before surgery so they don't have to leave to go to the bathroom during complex surgeries. Uh, and so are residents, so they don't get in trouble. They have to stand there for hours, uh, like hold their bladder to the point where people don't even know that they have uh, a full bladder anymore. And people have new onset constipation they've never had in their lives before that they, it continues after medical training because of that sleep deprivation, bullying. And I don't think I need to go into great detail here, but we also have confidentiality breaches unique to physicians because your records are on the EMR that all your colleagues and your program director and your boss and the CEO of the hospital can get into. Corruption, oh, at a high rate of corruption, there's a lot of money to be made in medicine, there's a lot of corruption in hospitals, and we feel like we're part of a criminal ring that we never even wanted to be part of, you know? And so we're like accomplices in this criminality when all we wanted to do was help people. And we feel exploited, you know, residents working for less than minimum wage for like up to seven years in some specialties, really terrible. And the retaliation that we get from just, I think you see with the PP. PPE adventure, you know, just standing up and advocating for patient safety got physicians fired for talking about we don't have PPE. So just this is really what we need to deal with, uh, you know, addressing the root cause so that we don't have so many doctors dying. And, and, and by the way, at the end, this is very inspirational. There is hope. These are actionable solutions. We're in the solution phase here. And then I'm going to end maybe in about five minutes and we can talk. Um, you can take these solutions today. And by the way, uh, this is a picture of military doctors. Actually, they had a mandatory wellness day where they had to do adult coloring book coloring. Uh, I just want to say that's really not the solution. I mean, it's a, okay, that's a cool idea, but you know, there's other bigger things to deal with here. Uh, at an AMSA conference, uh, they recommended swing dancing um, to help. Um, a journal, a gratitude journal, meditation, yoga. Um, one psychiatrist suggested that the, really the solution here was to set new bigger goals and start running marathons and triathlons. You know, well, I mean, really what I'm talking about is not individual solutions that are um, sometimes, again, adventures and perfectionism and competition, but really getting back to the real culprits. Uh, oh, and what is that, a wellness lecture. They're now doing wellness lectures on sleep hygiene with sleep deprived residents at 6 a.m. who can't leave the hospital until they go to the sleep hygiene lecture when they really should be sleeping. You know, we need to stop treating doctors as bad kindergartners and just let them do what they naturally know. How to, their, their bladder naturally knows when to empty if they could just get to the bathroom. They naturally know where to, to, how to sleep. They don't need a lecture on it if we could just have safe working conditions. So. Creating a culture of wellness, again, just to recap, and I'll share a little bit more on what this vet confessional is and how to deliver real confidential mental health care. Um, but these are simple things. I think you all see it would not be hard to create a recovery room and just have the chaplain help. The chaplain's already there getting paid by the hospital. 
Um, so here, let me just talk about um, the mental health situation. Our medical boards, hospital license, hospital credentialing committees, and even in-network insurance companies, if you want to apply to be a preferred provider, are asking questions that are illegal. They're non-compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. They are breaching our, our rights as American citizens. Um, by asking us questions, you know, where you end up having to, you know, they ask, have you ever, have you ever had depression? Well, you know, why is it that you would have to defend yourself if you had depression 10 years ago during a divorce to a medical board, you know, when you're completely competent now? Why would you have to bring up your postpartum depression hospitalization from 15 years ago to get a medical license. It makes no sense at all. This is an actual application section on the Alaska medical license with 25 yes or no mental health questions. This is absolutely creating a huge deterrent um, for people. The, Alaska is the worst state. Uh, the best states, by the way, Connecticut, Hawaii, Michigan, and New York do not ask any mental health questions, uh, but that's only four out of all the states. The problem is when you're in med school and residency, you don't know which state you're gonna fall in love with somebody and wanna move or work. And so if you end up in Alaska, even though you're in New York now, you might be scared to get mental health care because you wanna fill out these, uh, because of course in small print it says, if you lie on here, you're, we're gonna yank your license and you'll be in even more trouble. So you, know, so you have these doctors either secretly sneaking out of town, paying cash to get mental health care so that they can somehow lie on here, or they're just basically not getting mental health care so they can answer it honestly and continue to be mentally challenged, or emotionally challenged. So uh, I wanna share how one man made a difference, and I would just suggest you at the PDF of this to read this in detail, but essentially, I think there are some medical licenses like Georgia that require three peer references, and on the peer references, they actually asked, this was on a hospital credentialing committee, they asked the question, have you ever received treatment for mental health-related issues of a peer reference? And so this anesthesiologist found himself in a situation where he circled that question um, as the peer reference and said, this is really a problem, this question, and you should take it off your uh, form. And uh, surprisingly, a couple of weeks later, he received an email from the credentialing committee um, and he spoke with them about why they shouldn't have that question on there and they removed it right away. So I just want to share that if you speak up and you let, especially hospitals and uh, other it's harder with medical boards because they have a whole nother process, but, but you can remove these questions by just speaking up and saying these are, these are illegal under the Americans with Disabilities Act and have them, really the question should be phrased, are you currently competent? Not have you ever had, okay? Because that's really what they're aiming for is like, are you gonna be safe to practice medicine in our state and our hospital, right? So my question is, what action can you take or have you taken to protect physicians from being asked to disclose their confidential mental health treatment? Or maybe I could ask this as, what action will you take in the future? If you see one of these questions, please speak up because it's preventing people from accessing or feeling safe to access mental health care which they deserve. Uh, briefly, the Veterinary Confessional Project is super cool. Um, it's just a little um, anonymous board where people can post their feelings in a non-judgmental way. You can do it online, or sometimes at veterinary conferences, they have a little sort of a, uh, a poster board or like a, a big wall where people can write sticky notes and stuff like, um, so here this says I'm a vet without a pet and intend to stay that way because after having to give so much care to my clients and pets, I have nothing left to care for another animal at home. Very sad. I'm sure we can recognize that feeling as doctors uh, of human medicine. And this will decrease isolation and shame because I bet everyone's nodding their head like I see Russell like they can relate to this, right? Um, look up Veterinary Confessionals Project. They have a website. You can read more about how to do this in your own department, maybe. Here are some examples of things. You know, I feel guilty about being successful, like somehow I don't deserve it. I think that's a common feeling. I had a client who reported me to the state board for performing cat abortions. Um, you know, all sorts of things. I, I, you know, somebody's really concerned that they're going to have a, a, a bad effect under anesthesia and lose a pet. Um, lose one of their clients, you know, like, when is this going to catch up to me? Am I a horrible person, you know, for thinking this way? I feel like 
these are just anonymous comments on a little board and uh, so healing to walk by at a conference and recognize that you can relate to 90, if not 100% of what these people are writing, but yet we've never had an ability to share these true feelings with one another. And so we contain them and just go home and, and just become destructive, like by drinking wine, too much wine at night, or I don't know, like it is being it's cheating on our spouse or you know we do all these other sorts of weird things to deal with our trauma when we really just need to express ourselves and be honest um I mean, this is the one anesthesia scares me when will the odds catch up to me um so the question is finally what do you think about starting a confessional project at your medical institution in some form or fashion it's actually very a be beautiful project and it's essentially almost free it requires what sticky notes and a place to stick them <laughs> you know like it couldn't be easier to do um and finally expressing appreciation through action and this is something that every one of us can do today um, and just think about how, think about all the physicians and colleagues that you truly appreciate, but you've never actually pulled them aside to tell them, I appreciate you. And because we have somewhat of a, there's almost like a moat around us where we have trouble accepting appreciation because we're so busy, we have to get to the next patient. The way I recommend that you do this is you write a thank you card or an appreciation card because then you know, with people that are super tentorial and sort of dehumanized with their emotions shut down, it's much easier to sit and read a card over and over again and let it seep in than tell somebody, hey, Joe, I really appreciate what you did. It's just going to go, it might not stick. You know what I mean? Get specific, write a few sentences in a thank you card. This could make a huge difference in somebody's life. In fact, it could prevent suicide and it has in physicians. Um, these are just some ideas, taking a physician out for lunch or dinner, giving a gift, taking call for a physician, uh, just publicly acknowledging them with an award of some sort, or even just a thank you note, uh, even a text, you know, a, an appreciate, a text of appreciation actually saved an ENT's life. I'm going to share the actual text with you in a slide uh, coming up here, and then we can do the Q&A if we still have time. Um, these are just a few quotes. Having practiced medicine for 45 years, I was always lifted up when patients thanked me. It's been more satisfying than the money I earned. Thank you notes and letters really help. Um, this is actually a bridge uh, somewhere where people, I think in the UK, j jump off this bridge. Um, this one woman who was standing on the bridge considering jumping decided not to, and then went back to the bridge and left uh, these little notes for people and these notes actually prevented at least 17 suicides from that bridge and the people who some of them who their lives were saved by reading these little laminated notes actually tracked her down and thanked her um, so I just want to let you know that like one sentence can save somebody's life a well-placed note <laughs> can save somebody's life at the end of a hard day after delivering a stillborn or a maternal death or something like that right so uh, these are ways that you can do it. And two more slides here. I keep every note for my patients. It's definitely prevented me. Uh, I can't read that because it's blocked. I think it says suicide, prevented me from dying by suicide. There are days I want to give up, but I see the letters, thank you notes, knitting, jewelry, cards for patients. I keep going. I'm reminded life is more about uh, more than just pain and suffering. And this is the final slide here um, by an ENT doctor. Here's the text that prevented my suicide. Uh, the right hand side is blocked by my like seeing all your faces. I think I could shut that if I could, but I can't really easily do it now. So you can read it, right? Hey, I'm sorry about your patient. That sucks. I'm very thankful for having you as an excellent otolaryngologist to learn from. You take care of so many sick patients and do a marvelous job educating us how to say, do the same safely, safely, skillfully, and compassionately well. Thank you for that. It's been a particularly hard year for me, but I'm surviving. Thanks for all you do. This, 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 this one text prevented an ENT doctor from taking his life. So um, my final question is, are you willing to personally demonstrate your appreciation to your colleagues, to physicians in your medical institution, and how specifically will you do that? And uh, maybe what compassion project are you willing to champion in your medical ins institution? And we're finally at Q&A. I know it was long, but I think it was uh, hard to compress all that information into something shorter. Dr. Weibel, thank you so much. Uh, it was <clears throat> fantastic. And, and I really want to just to, um, acknowledge how important it is for role models like you to speak about that you had had your own thoughts of suicide and 
and to shed light on that, I think it's really inspiring for other people. I'm not a physician, but I had a similar issue which I talk about regularly. Um, and, and it was through really my colleagues and, and friends that were brave enough to reach out to me that I'm, I'm thankful that I'm still here. So thank you for sharing that. And for, yeah, for everything, it was really inspiring. Yeah. Um, so uh, what, what questions, comments, reactions do people have? What thoughts do you have? Yeah, I, I have a comment. Uh, earlier, there was uh, another uh, Zoom meeting, and I shared that uh, one of my patients committed suicide and had completed a PHQ-9 that was zero, okay? Then one of the psychiatrists in the webinar, you know, sent me an email, you know, if there's anything I can help you with. I said, oh, thank you very much. And there was a, a recent suicide in my community, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, like, the first month, you know, all the medical staff meetings, they talk about the support and this and that, and then nothing. So I think that we should have, and I mentioned this to the uh, psychiatrist that sent me the email, we should have a regular outreach for everybody. Most people are gonna say, I don't have a problem. Okay, but there will be a few that will say, maybe I need to seek some help. Okay, but that's not happening. Okay, yeah, usually when uh, people are involved with uh, medical board uh, uh, committees, you know, they already have a problem. Okay, they, but we want to reach the people that have been working well. Okay, they're under stress.